Hello and welcome to our Lakeside Chat. We are David Wofford and Katie Noonan, co-chairs of the Rotary Nature Center Friends. And we're so happy that you can join us tonight. As we begin our program, it is important for us to acknowledge that we are on stolen land, that Lake Merritt is part of Ohlone territory. We hear now from Corinna Gould, spokesperson for the Confederated Villages of Lashon and co-founder of Segura Tay Land Trust. Good afternoon, relatives. My name is Karina Gould. I am the spokesperson for the Confederated Villages of Lashon. We are here today at what most folks think of as Lake Merritt. Uh, we are in the territory of Huchin. Huchin is actually a territory that encompasses six Bay Area cities, Oakland, Berkeley, Alameda, Emeryville, Albany, and Piedmont. And this was a place of abundance. I'm so happy that people from all walks of life that now come into our territory can enjoy this beautiful place that my ancestors have enjoyed since the beginning of time. My relationship to the land, the land that I have been born to, raising my children and grandchildren here, has been to tell the story, the truth, of what happened on this land before other people came here. I'm hoping that as we begin to learn these lessons of fires in California, the pandemic that's happening, that human beings come back to living in reciprocity with the earth. Thank you, Karina. We wanted to mention that um, Oakland has a special um, distinction of being a, the, one of the first, the first city to return um, land to native people as reparations for the land that was stolen uh, from them during the um, the pioneer and colonial period. So um, very glad that um, we have that distinction. So welcome everybody. Um, we're going to get started um, and I'll introduce Noah uh, Whiteman in just a few minutes. Um, I want to share a few highlights of our month. Uh, we are Rotary Nature Center friends a very small, all volunteer, nonprofit organization with a big mission. Um, we are dedicated to sharing um, the enjoyment of nature and the knowledge that um, that is um, you know calling to us when we are uh, at Lake Merritt and we think about the context of where we are, and how things are changing in with climate change, with um, human community um, changes and conflicts. Um, it's such a great window on the world. So I wanted to share a few things uh, from our past month. So what are the things Rotary Nature Center Friends has been doing since um, the uh, fish kill? and actually quite a bit before, is collecting um, basic water quality data. And this has become a little more interesting. Um, there was a long period when we were in the drought and water quality was pretty much the same uh, for a long time. But um, with the fish kill, it seemed very important to follow the um, amount of dissolved oxygen in the lake and other um, um, abiotic factors uh, that might affect the possible return of the um, of the organism, harmful algal um, species that cause so much problem. So um, one of the things we've been doing is working with young people to take water quality using a professional sond on loan from the water boards. Um, the Kids are on vacation this month pretty much, and um, I've been very much um, delighted to have the help of the Oakland Rowing Club um, to get out on the lake and test different parts of the lake for um, water quality. We've had some um, very poor water quality, which I posted on our uh, Facebook um, page, but uh, recently, uh, as, as of last Tuesday, uh, we went out just before the big storm, and uh, lo and behold, the um, water quality in the larger um, Trestle Glen arm of the lake was really decent. It was it met the water quality standards, and there was a lot of wind going on at that time. A huge, um, a, a lot of wind that also can contribute to turning over and and mixing of the lake. 
Um, we're also trying to keep an eye on um, whether the tide gates are open or closed uh, by direct observation when we can, and also by um, looking at data collected by the city of Oakland, which you can see on their website. So um, really glad to report that uh, it is not all gloom and doom um, all the time in Lake Merritt as far as oxygen is concerned. There have been no fish kills. We've got people looking around the lake um, and there have not been fish kills. So that's also good news. Um, some of our youth and science, science and stewardship projects um, that we are continuing is to um, clean up because humans are a big hazard actually at the lake, um, a big problem because they leave so much plastic trash and other kinds of trash, sometimes chemicals um, at the lake that can harm organisms. Um, and one of the other things that we look for are plankton. So we're working with the California Department of Public Health um, citizen monitoring program. So the students collect um, plankton samples and we send them in to the Richmond lab and get a report about what um, species are there and if there's anything of concern. Now, they don't necessarily look for or see uh, all of the species that might be a problem, but uh, it's certainly a way of keeping track. We also have been working um, with the state on that and involving citizens in the collection of the samples, which is actually pretty simple. Okay, we also had a highlight this um, month uh, or last month with the Oakland Main Library. And we um, showed off um, some of the uh, plankton samples we got, some of the student work and so forth. So that was um, happy and wonderful time to be able to share. Um, one of our uh, things that we do every, um, every Saturday when we have students. About, about ready to have the speaker. Yes, I'm sorry. Who is speaking, please? Oh, here oh. Okay, no worries, people. I will stop talking soon. Uh, we start, we're always going to start at 712. So um, thank you for, for listening to this because, you know, we would like to have everybody know. So here we have um, a Dutchman's Pipe. We might hear about that in the talk. Um, planted by young people in 2018, not 2028. And um, we are um, involving people in the stewardship of that. So at this point, now it's my great pleasure tonight to introduce what everyone is waiting for, um, our wonderful um, special guest speaker tonight, Noah Whiteman. Uh, Noah just published, uh, published a fascinating book, um, which is um, connect so many things in our lives with um, a love of nature and um, and a naturalist eye, and then of course a superb um, academic um, approach. So no one is the evol an evolutionary biologist at UC Berkeley. Um, he's a professor of integrative biology and of molecular and cell biology. He's um, the director of the Essig Museum of um, uh, Entomology and is affiliated with um, the Neuroscience Institute, Ellen Wills, Center for Computational Biology, Museum of Vertebrate Zoology, and the uh, University and Jepson Herbaria. So um, we are so privileged to have you here tonight, Noah. Thank you, Katie. Can you hear me okay? Yes. Great. So it's my pleasure to be here. I really appreciate the invitation. It's always, you know, a, a delight to speak to a local audience, although people can beam in from other places too. But I love Lake Merritt as well. And I thought it was a coastal lagoon, but I learned something new today too. Um, and I was just there the other day with my husband walking through the bonsai um, garden. And uh, yeah, so great to be here. And thanks for giving me a chance to chat with you about my book. And my hope is that this is very informal. And I, I thought what I would do is um, kind of walk through a couple stories that I think um, people connect to both from a natural history perspective and a human oriented perspective. 
Um, and so there, there are a couple chapters I'll highlight, but I thought I would first just talk about the, the, the cover of this book. Um, and I think it's kind of uh, revealing, which was the intent um, of the, what the sort of arc of the book is about. And this is kind of patterned after, you know, these Dutch Golden Age Vanita paintings um, that were, were done to sort of illustrate or illuminate the vanity of, of our earthly pursuits. And, you know, to tell the story that even the richest among us are going to die. Everyone dies, right? It's the only thing that that we know to be true, right? That we know to, to, to be uh, in, in everyone's future. And um, those, those Vanitas often had um, objects that were, you know, uh, coveted. So they could be things like, you know, a beautiful vase, um, uh, a, a shell, like a nautilus shell, something like that, a lamp. And there was often, though, a skull, a snuffed out candle, something like that. Also to remind, you know, that these things, these objects um, were simply um, of this earth, right? And that everyone um, is going to leave it. But for this particular one, um, it was to, meant to illustrate the duality of these chemicals uh, that we all use and, and some abuse. And so that is what these objects represent for the most part. So you'll see there's a, a stein of beer, there's an orange or a mandarin, and these were often in these paintings. And the idea was, you know, to get to the sweet flesh, you have to go through the bitter peel. <laughs> and so, you know, the, I, I want you to think about this duality as I talk about these chemicals. And if you haven't read the book yet, that's kind of the, the main point. And then you can also see that there's a monarch here that's a uh, butterfly illustrated that's right on the edge of that cup of coffee or tea. So there's coffee or tea, there's a cigarette. Uh, I talk about tobacco. I talk about uh, coffee and tea in the book. This is a, a poppy an opium poppy and you can see the latex that uh, the illustrator has made here dripping out of the capsule. This is where opium comes from and where the morphine and alkaloids come from like morphine and codeine and eventually heroin. And then in this uh, this little terrarium are, is a, a toad um, and this particular toad I talk about in the book produces a psychedelic compound called 5-MeO-DMT. And then um, psilocybin mushrooms and actually many different mushrooms um, uh, in a fairly close related group of species produce psilocybin, which is a, a type of DMT. It's a phosphated version of DMT. So these, these tryptamine alkaloids I talk about in the book as well. And then black pepper, that's in the pepper grinder, um, which um, was the king of spices um, I also discuss. So I thought I would start with um, just a little bit of an overview of, of chapter three. And chapter three focuses on a class of chemicals called terpenoids. And the book is kind of organized by a chemical class or type. And it was very hard to, to figure out how to organize this book because there's a lot of themes that, that intersect, um, uh, you know, to sort of tell the story of nature's toxins. And I thought this would be a relatively straightforward way. So... I, I spend a lot of uh, chapter three talking about these uh, terpenoid chemicals that enter our lives frequently in our diet and in drugs that we take in medicines um, and in, in recreational drugs as well. And um, terpenoids um, all have something called an isoprene backbone. So isoprene, you'll see a picture of this chemical in a minute. Um, isoprene is um, emitted by plants as kind of a waste product, but plants um, also use isoprene to create things like these terpenoids. And our bodies also emit isoprene. It's part of the cholesterol biosynthetic pathway. And so in our breath, isoprene is emitted. So it turns out isoprene is a really important chemical as a starting point uh, for terpenoids. And um, some of the earliest plants that left traces in the fossil record are ones like this, actually, that uh, include representatives that are still around. And these are liverworts, which you probably have seen growing on the ground, right? These are these strap, they have strap leaf-like structures. Um, they might be growing in a pot, you know, in your garden outside. They're, they're very small. 
They're very pretty. They're kind of emerald green. And um, there's some fascinating things about the coevolutionary story. So that's the, the reciprocal evolutionary story between liverworts um, and uh, arthropods over deep time that I wanted to share with you that kind of helps understand, help I think helps us understand where these chemicals actually come from and why they first arose. So this is an incredible fossil um, that was um, actually discovered by uh, Susan Tremblay, a student from UC Berkeley, a PhD student. Um, and it's a, uh, a, basically a slice of a liverwort um, leaf that I just showed you. And the thing I want you to notice, you can, you can make out the cell walls here. Do you see that? And then you can see these dark structures sort of interspersed every here and there, okay? So this is like a single cell layer thick and you're looking at the cell walls. These things um, we think are oil body cells. And the reason we think that, and this is, this is really incredible. So this is a, th on the left, is a 387 million year old fossil. So this is Devonian, you know, there were no, there were no vertebrates on land. <laughs> Our ancestors had not colonized land yet. So, right, so this is, a, this is a long time ago. This is in the age of fishes, jawless fishes. And this on the right is a slice through a homologous structure from a living liverwort, from a modern liverwort that you would find in your garden. And so these also have oil body cells. I don't know if you can see that. And that's how we, th that's why we think that things in the fossils are oil body cells. We, we will never know that they were oil body cells, right? Because this is a rock on the left. <laughs> but on the right, this is an actual, you know, living leaf that was recently preserved. And what is, what we know from the, the modern liverworts are that these, these oil body cells contain terpenoids that, um, allow the plant to defend itself against um, herbivorous animals, things that would eat the plant. So what, what this is saying is these structures now today in liverworts that serve to protect them against natural enemies. So if an, a little insect would bite that, that liverwort, those oil body cells would release their contents into the mouth of the environment associated with that animal. And those chemicals um, you'll see in a minute are quite diverse and they are terpenoids by and large. And so terpenoids we think have been produced by plants for at least 387 million years, probably longer. Um, and, you know, produced in at very high levels in certain tissues, probably as a defense against natural enemies. So this is showing you what some of these structures look like. Here's what isoprene looks like. And if you look closely, you can actually see the isoprene um, backbones in these molecules. You don't have to be an organic chemist to see this, right? Isoprene is the backbone for these things. And these terpenoids are these just diverse various terpenoids that um, have toxicity against animals. And so why would a plant waste energy making this? It's not, it could, it could put the energy that, it, that it's using to make these chemicals into making spores, into making, right, the next generation but it's not, it's, it's taking some of that energy and pointing it into strange Baroque chemicals that don't, aren't required by the plant to live, except if there are enemies around. So this is the story of nature's toxins, that these plants are making these weird chemicals to protect themselves from enemies. Really, really uh, fascinating. So isoprene, um, also shows up in the Mona Lisa. So it's thought that the bluish tint to the Tuscan Hills is from the isoprene that is emitted by trees. It's emitted in such quantities. It's, it's um, sort of global climate changing quantities by plants every year. And it's probably why many mountain ranges are called blue mountains or smoky mountains around the world uh, because isoprene reacts with chemicals in the air, gases in the air and creates this blue haze. Um, it can also produce smog. Natural rubber is made of po a polymer of isoprene molecules. And rubber is simply the latex from, in this case, from the Para rubber tree, which is native to Brazil, but is um, 
it is grown in, in tree farms all over the tropics, especially Southeast Asia, where it's not native. Um, that's where a lot of rubber comes from. Um, and that is simply uh, polymers of isoprene. And why would a plant make this? Well, it's not making it to give us tires, even though all modern tires, including the tires on your car, have natural rubber that comes from this tree. Um, the tree is making it uh, to protect itself from enemies. So not only does it just serve as sort of a, a, a trap for, for natural enemies, it also can carry toxins in its uh, latex itself, like milkweed, which I'll talk about momentarily. Another isoprene-based molecule terpenoid that you might recognize is alpha-pinene, which is one of those volatiles that you sense when you walk through a fir, redwood, spruce, or pine forest, that piney smell. Or if you use pine salt to clean your floors, that's also found in... Um, you know, uh, uh, alpha pinene is also found in these in these solvents that we use to clean our houses. And what's interesting, we've studied this a little in my lab. The the alpha pinene and other terpenoids, many of them actually target something in the animal brain and the human brain called the GABA receptor. This is the same receptor. It's the it's an inhibitory receptor. So it's a neurons that are inhibitory, and they when they fire, your brain activity goes down. And that results in you eventually falling asleep. So things like Ambien also target the GABA receptor. Things like ethanol, alcohol, also target the GABA receptor. So these plants have evolved these chemicals that, you know, put insects to sleep if they start eating them. And that's the point, right, is that the alpha pinene wasn't invented by nature, by evolution, to help us clean our floors, you know, or to, or to have us enjoy the walk through the, the pine forest. That's not why it's there. So another terpenoid that has that became really important because it was really um, uh, this this chemical digoxin, which comes from digitalis or foxglove, which is an ornamental plant native to Europe and Asia. And this is a picture of William Withering getting the recipe for treating congestive heart failure, which used to be called dropsy, from this um, this woman that he wrote about as he described her, an old woman from Shropshire had the recipe that he used to eventually figure out that foxglove was the active ingredient that would allow people um, to be cured of dropsy because it would target this particular pump in heart cells that causes the heart to contract a little bit more when it binds to it. But the dose, the, the sort of toxic dose and the therapeutic dose, the difference is very narrow. <laughs> so right? So it, it has to be very carefully monitored. It's still used to treat arrhythmias though. So maybe a million prescriptions or so were used um, in the last year were written for digoxin in the United States. And what's interesting is that these are called cardiac glycosides because they do target heart cells. And another plant family, the milkweeds, um, also makes cardiac glycosides. So they've independently evolved the ability to make them. And the monarch that uh, was, that Katie described earlier, um, you know, they're brightly colored because natural selection has endowed them with the ability to warn predators from eating them because they're poisonous. So if you ate a monarch, you would get a higher dose um, of cardiac glycosides than you would get if you had a prescription of digoxin from your doctor. So the idea is that birds selected for the bright coloration um, and for the ability of the monarchs to sequester the cardiac glycosides as caterpillars, carry them through metamorphosis, hold them in their wings, and they use them to protect themselves against natural enemies that has evolved through natural selection. And my lab has studied how the monarch actually resists those toxins itself. So it's evolved changes in the sodium pump protein that 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 toxin targets that allows it to resist the toxin. So this is a story of a natural insecticide, you know, millions of years before people were around, right? These plants were evolving these insecticides. Some insects overcame them. So like the monarch is able to actually tap into the milkweed's powers and steal them for its own devices. Okay, so um, the poison arrow tree is another member of this Apocynaceae this is from Africa, mostly from East Africa, and it also produces cardiac glycosides, but it's rather interesting because it's been used um, by many different people, uh, peoples in, in East Africa, 
um, as a medicinal and as an arrow poison. And um, one of the uh, cardiac glycosides is called Wabane. And this is also called G-Strabanthin. And there's a reason I'm telling you these details. And I'll show you in a, in a minute why that's important. Um, and these plants are making it just like the milkweed is presumably as a defense, it's in their latex. Um, and Wabane was used for a long time in Europe to treat um, heart conditions as well. So it's kind of like digoxin in that way. It just comes from a different plant family. And here's, this is kind of an amazing story. This is um, not a skunk. So it looks like, a, how many people think it's a skunk? Well, it looks like a skunk, but it's not a skunk. It's a rat and it's called the maned rat or the crested rat. It's fairly common in Africa. And what this thing does is it goes to the poison arrow tree and chews the bark of that tree, it forms like this masticate, and then it anoints itself. It spreads that, that slurry of bark all along the side of its body. And it has evolved wick-like hairs, which you can see here, that wick up the cardiac glycosides into the hairs, and that protects the rat from predators, from things like dogs that would attack them. And that is why that thing has warning coloration. That is why it's black and white and very obvious, right? Most rats are not very obvious. Um, well, the ones in my backyard are kind of obvious, but they're not, they're not black and white like a skunk, right? So skunks are black and white also, right? That has been selected for by predators, right? They have a defense as well. It's a different one than this, but they've sort of converged. The animal brain has selected for these common patterns. Okay, so that's kind of amazing. We're still talking about the same terpenoid uh, family here. And this is where I think it gets really interesting. So chemists in the 1940s took um, that strapanthin molecule and they, they did some chemical reactions and they were able to synthesize the first form of uh, synthetic or semi-synthetic progesterone that uh, they thought might be used someday as the birth control pill. Okay, so now we have a connection from these milkweeds, right? This strapanthin, this cardiac glycoside to a chemical that is, could be used maybe as a hormone. The problem was it was kind of a greasy chemical. It wasn't gonna be easily absorbed, this particular one, this 10 norprogesterone that they made. Nonetheless, it was kind of an important um, event because they were able to tweak the chemical bonds to create a slightly new structure. So building on that, this um, undergraduate student, 26-year-old Louis Miri Montes, who was at the, he was an undergraduate at the Autonomous University in Mexico City, UNAM. And this is a picture of him in 1953. This is what Louis Miri Montes did. This is his lab notebook. And he synthesized actually from um, a terpenoid that's from inedible yams that can weigh up to 200 pounds, these giant tubers, diascorea. He, um, he used the same logic that those chemists used to turn that cardiac glycoside into a progesterone. Here, he just used one from a yam and he created what became the birth control pill, uh, the main ingredient in the birth control pill. So his formulation, he was the first person to synthesize this and they patented it. It was eventually purchased by Park Davis and became what um, many people on this call have taken as a birth control pill. <laughs> so this, this string of events, right, that, that we can trace um, back even to Wabane, right, to these poison arrow trees um, and sort of humans tinkering with these things um, led to something that transformed the lives of billions of people and here's um, the yam that this, uh, this inedible yam has a codex, which is this kind of, um, you know, stem-like structure. These things can weigh 200 pounds um, and the plants are making these saponins, which are terpenoids, presumably to defend themselves against natural enemies. And so that chemical served as a template for an amazing drug. Now, this is the other thing that people get really interested in in, in the book. Um, that I, when I've talked about this, there are two terpenoids that are in coffee, basically all coffee beans, whether it's um, Coffea robusta or Coffea arabica, have these terpenoids. One is called cafestol, one is called kawiol. Kawiol is named after the Arabic um, word for coffee. 
And there's a reason I'm showing you a French press. And that is because if you drink coffee out of a French press and you don't filter it, your cholesterol levels, your LDLC cholesterol levels, which are sort of the bad cholesterol levels, are higher than they would be if you did not do that. And the reason we know that is a, a, a large number of epidemiological studies and clinical trials focused on people in Scandinavia that were drinking Scandinavian boiled coffee in the 60s, 70s, and 80s had high LDL cholesterol levels that were sort of pegged to how much coffee they were drinking. And Scandinavian coffee is boiled, it's not filtered. And they noticed, the epidemiologists, that people who drank filtered coffee did not have this problem. And so they eventually figured out that these two chemicals are the most potent LDL-inducing chemicals in the human diet. We know what receptors they bind to, and they sort of trick your liver into making LDL cholesterol levels. It's not like the cholesterol in food, right, that might raise your levels or the precursors. That's not what these are. So these trigger... Um, a receptor, you know, a cascade of events occurs where the liver ends up making more cholesterol. Why would the coffee bean make these? Well, we don't know, but presumably as defenses against natural enemies, it's not to make cholesterol go up for organisms that are eating them, but it could be a problem for you. And so um, that's something that, um, you know, I, I stumbled on in the book that I used to drink coffee out of French press. I don't do that anymore. I use a filter. So this little vignette I shared with you on the terpenoids kind of shows you my approach when thinking about these things, tying in deep time coevolution between organisms to understand where some of the chemicals that have played a role in our daily lives and in, and in history, um, in human history, um, have come from. The last one that I'll share with you are, are these alkaloids, which are, you know, some of the most important drugs that we take are alkaloids, both as medicines and recreationally. And um, alkaloids really are, are chemicals that have a nitrogen atom in them and they're organic molecules. That there's not much else that unites them actually beyond that. Um, but you can see the nitrogens here in this caffeine molecule. You've probably even seen this structure before because right, if there's one chemical that we um, are all fairly dependent on, um, uh, in our diets, it's caffeine. And I'm showing here a pour over with a filter because this is how I drink my coffee now. Although, you know, I drink a cappuccino every now and then and espresso levels have sort of in between capistol and kawaii levels. But what we're after in the coffee, most of us, is the caffeine. And it turns out that caffeine is a natural insecticide. So in 1984, it was shown experimentally by James Nathanson um, by spraying plants like tomato plants that don't make caffeine, by spraying them with caffeine, putting insects on them that would normally eat the tomato leaves, they didn't eat the tomato leaves and it was sort of a dose dependent response. But not only that, this is, was amazing. He found that concentrations of caffeine that are found naturally in undried tea leaves or coffee beans, somewhere between you know, 0.68 to 2.1%, were sufficient to kill these moth larvae, suggesting that these, these uh, methyl xanthines, which are the, the family that caffeine belongs to of alkaloids, could function as insecticides for the plants. And so, and that also turned out to be true because the plants, when they were sprayed with these insecticides, were found to be resistant to um, these chemicals. Another hint is that if you look across the family tree of plants, so here's a bunch of plant orders listed here, the ability to synthesize caffeine has evolved six times independently, as far as we know. That means, you know, six different branches of the plant tree of life have independently um, evolved the ability to synthesize caffeine and similar methyl xanthines. And I'm showing you here in this paper, they looked at, like, here's cacao, right? So that's from um, the, the plant that we use to make chocolate. This is um, a plant from the uh, Brazilian rainforest that uh, people there use um, uh, as a drink. Citrus puts caffeine in its nectar, and we think they do that to get bees to get reinforced memories to come back and pollinate them. They're manipulating bee minds, we think. There have been great experiments done on that. Uh, Camellia sinensis, that's the tea family. And then here's coffee down here. There's another um, order, the aquafoliales, which includes holly and yerba mate. They also make caffeine, 
right? So Yerba Mate, my Argentine and Uruguayan friends use that as a stimulant, right, instead of coffee. And, um, but you can see this has popped up across the tree of life. And that's a big hint that it's doing something beneficial for these plants in terms of natural selection. Now we use caffeine at moderate doses because it increases our alertness, decreases fatigue, improves our reaction time. And this was kind of fascinating. I stumbled on this. It also decreases risk of depression and suicide to a degree that I found to be surprising. I wanted to share that with you. So there have been these large cohort studies. Here's just one example of a study. This was a study about 51,000 US women Mean age was 63 years. They were free of depressive symptoms at the baseline in 1996, and they were prospectively followed up through June 1st, 2006. This is actually a nurse's study. And what I want you to see is here's cups of coffee per week, less than one, you know, or equal to one, two to six, one cup per day, two to three cups per day, or over four cups per day. And what you can see here is this is depression risk according to a baseline. So one means that's the baseline. And um, if it's below one, that's a reduced depression risk. So if people who had were drinking four cups a day or greater had, you know, a, an 18 percent um, lower depression risk, and you can see the dose here sort of drops over time. So it even goes up to if you look at all the data, it's about a 20 percent re uh, reduction in depression risk for people who were drinking four cups a day. The problem with these studies is that this is um, it could be driven by something called selection bias where people drinking more coffee might be just less inclined to be depressed. But I doubt that <laughs> for various reasons. Um, I think people are using it in part to avoid being depressed. Um, but there's a lot of controversy about the details, but these this appears over and over and over in the literature. The other one that actually is more sobering is that suicide risk is, uh, is associated with an even more dramatic reduction uh, with respect to caffeine use. And I'll just show you that. And this is um, a much larger cohort study of 207,000 doctors and nurses, men and women, that was across a, a 10 year span. And keep in mind that, you know, the power of this study statistically is limited by, you know, the number of people who died. So not that many people die of suicide, fortunately, right? And so, you know, keep in mind that this is a small numbers issue too, but still, what you can see is as the number of cups of coffee goes up, the suicide risk goes down to the point where there's a 50% reduction in risk for people who are drinking four cups a day or more. And with each two cup increment, you reduce the, the suicide risk by 0 0.25. So this is, this is incredible, right? If you think about it. Um, and the question is, is there a cause effect link we can make here? And we don't know yet, but this is definitely a correlation that I think is worth paying attention to and investigating. Okay, now it's not all roses, right? And this is the duality I wanted you to keep in mind. So caffeine didn't evolve to reduce depression risk or suicide risk in humans. It looks like it evolved at high concentrations to prevent animals from eating these plants. And um, so there are harms that can occur as a result of overdoing it. Um, including lower infant birth weight. So this is something that appears over and over is that there's a higher probability of a lower birth rate, uh, infant birth rate for people who are drinking even moderate levels of caffeine in, during pregnancy. And this is something that came up over and over again. And um, it's not clear exactly why that is, but, and then at very high doses just for people who aren't pregnant, severe anxiety, increased blood pressure, and uh, can be fatal if mixed with alcohol, depending on the concentration. And then in a very sad situation, I just want to share, um, this is when pure caffeine uh, was available in, in many countries in a powdered form. It no longer is easily obtainable in this way in the US or Australia. And the reason is um, these teenagers died from overdoses. And this was a 15 year old, very sad story um, of a man who had some caffeine that he got from a friend. It was powdered, powdered caffeine, so pure caffeine. He put it in a protein shake that he was making for himself before going to bed. He put it in there, drank the shake, kissed his parents goodnight, went to bed and died. So, you know, this is an example of, you know, caffeine, we have to remember, it is it did not evolve for our benefit, right? It all of these things um, at the wrong dose, in the wrong time, in the wrong place 
can be very problematic. So it's we we have to look at these things um, not as uh, you know gifts from God. They certainly weren't. <laughs> so the evidence we have is they evolved millions of years before humans were around to, for other purposes, right? To endow the organisms that are making those compounds with the ability to manipulate animals, defend themselves against animals and microbes, or in the case of citrus, bring um, bring pollinators into the flowers even. So this war of nature between plants and insects is what has driven a lot of the production of the chemicals that we use and abuse. And here's just, just a list of the World Health Organization world list of essential medicines, about 40% are from plants and from animals and microbes. So from nature, not synthetic. And here are, are those I'm just showing you here from plants. You might recognize some of them on here like Taxol. Some of you may have received Taxol as a chemotherapy, um, which comes from the Pacific U plant. That's just one example. And of course, it's not just medicines, it's spices that we use, right? Um, all of these amazing spices at their core are these chemicals that are triggering our pain receptors usually, um, our taste receptors sometimes, our sense of smell, and even other receptors in our brains. Um, and it was the pursuit of these spices. Here's an example um, of four of the maybe most important spices in the history of the last of the last 500 years of our of our history here's black pepper um, this is nutmeg and then of course mace is the arrow that is wrapped around the nutmeg seed um, this is uh these are clove flowers so cloves are the flower buds from this particular tree and these are ginger roots here and these three are these two i should say nutmeg and um cloves really were grown in the in a, just a few islands um, called the Moluccas, the Banda Islands in Indonesia, and became a source of major conflict that changed the world, which I also talk about in the book. So um, Portugal was uh, the first, uh, the first ships carrying the Portuguese flag made their way around um, South Africa, eventually made their way to India. And uh, that is when Europe European forces sort of took over the spice trade from the overland and Arabian sea routes through the Mediterranean that had been, um, you know, uh, traversed for hundreds or thousands of years before. And that really changed the dynamic um, uh, of the spice trade and of geopolitics. And it was the Treaty of, of Brita. So the European powers fought over control of the spice trade, including the islands that include now Indonesia. And eventually um, the Netherlands and Britain signed a treaty giving those islands, all of them, um, control of them politically to the Dutch. And this Treaty of Breda was kind of uh, monumental for other reasons because it also resulted in the trading of what was called New Netherlands, which included the island of Manhattan, for this island of Run that was the last island controlled by Britain in the Banda Islands where nutmeg and cloves were native to. And so the Dutch got a hold of this uh, from Britain and in exchange, the English, the British got New Netherlands. And so you could say, you know, one way of thinking about this is that it was a, a nutmeg, you know, and the and alkaloid that's a nutmeg drove this geopolitical kind of tur turmoil that eventually led to the United States, right? Um, it's not that simple, of course, but it's one way of thinking about it. And because Britain was kicked out of the spice trade, essentially, um, yet they still had possession of India, what they did uh, to sort of deal with the trade um, imbalance they had with China over tea. So the British people became totally addicted to tea and the caffeine in tea. And the, they were buying that from the Chinese with sterling. And so there was this huge trade deficit. And what they decided to do to correct it was to grow opium in India and smuggle it illegally into China. And eventually about, a, it's estimated about a third of the men in China became addicted to opium as a result of the smuggling of opium into China. 
And there were there were some issues going on in China beyond this, but it eventually led to the Opium Wars that brought down the 2000 year Qing Dynasty. And so one way of looking at that is that this alkaloid, you know, that morphine um, was a driver of a major geopolitical upheaval that led to what the Chinese call us the century of humiliation and eventually the communist revolution there and what we have now is modern China. And so you can look at that through this same lens as our pursuit of these alkaloids and this, this sort of demand for tea in Britain and the demand for opium in China mediating this geopolitical upheaval. And then in your own life, in our own lives, we can we know of people, maybe you yourself have struggled with your interaction with some of these chemicals, whether it's nicotine, alcohol, other drugs. And in my own life, that has certainly been true. Um, and I didn't ever think I would write a book about this, but what happened was my dad died of alcohol use disorder, which is the, is the sort of modern word for alcoholism. And, you know, I started thinking about why yeast are making ethanol at such high concentrations. And we think they do that from an adaptive perspective because they're resistant to about 20% ethanol concentrations. Most microbes die in alcohol that's that high. So these, these yeast are able to take um, sugar, turn it into alcohol, and then they live in that sort of that toxic private reserve. Later, they can tap into it as an energy source. They keep other microbes out of it. And so they have this huge foothold. They're creating this like toxic larder for themselves, which is just incredible. So I started thinking about that and thinking about my dad using alcohol to, you know, escape his own enemies. Um, and there were, there were these commonalities that I couldn't ignore. And then I was studying the monarch, which is stealing chemicals from the milkweed to protect itself from enemies as well. They're also toxic. So, you know, my worlds kind of collided in 2017 when he died. And that's when I decided to write the book. This is just showing you some of my research, you know, the, the paths that crossed here. And it wasn't just my dad. Here's a picture of him and me. It was my, on my maternal side of my family, my aunt died um, on the way to write the book, you know, my husband and I stopped in northern Minnesota to see her and she died of complications uh, from alcohol use disorder, too. So both sides of my family tree have been afflicted uh, with this uh, struggle, um, this alcohol use disorder. Um, and this is just showing you on the way to write the book. Um, I eventually ended up in Vermont and I got married there. And I talk about that in the book. I talk about the toxins that are in the boutonnieres of the plants that we <laughs> that we had for boutonnieres. But this is just to show that, like, you know, these um, this duality that um, I describe, that these chemicals that are swirling around in our lives that were invented not for us, that we use um, at our own risk, um, have these two sides often even ones that are beneficial, even ones that are, you know, that allow us to maybe enjoy the moment more. When we take it too far, they can kill us. And that, you know, I and probably you have been affected by this. So um, with that, I just want to summarize the main points. This war of nature that I hope I've convinced you is real has been raging on land for 400 million years between plants and their enemies and vulnerable organisms that can't move like plants and fungi evolve chemical defenses uh, to allow themselves uh, to uh, survive. And um, some animals like monarchs and like us evolved to overcome those chemicals and use them for our own devices. We're not that different from the monarch or the yeast and in our own evolution, our wars, our geopolitics, and our day-to-day -day health and wellness can be traced back to our pursuit of these ancient chemical weapons. And even things like the founding of the United States, for example, can be traced back to our pursuit of these chemicals. So I wanna thank um, a few people, my editor, uh, Tracy Bahar, and my agent, Russell Weinberger, and Julie Johnson was the amazing illustrator who illustrated all of the 25 drawings in the book. 
And if you want to learn more, you can go to um, mostdeliciouspoison.com. So I have that website and the notes for the book are on that and links to uh, buying the book are on there too. I narrated the audiobook, so that's available from Amazon and Audible too. And then I just want to thank my colleagues at um, Berkeley who were very supportive of my writing a book that was very broad and interdisciplinary and outside of the normal kind of scholarly routine. So I really appreciate my Berkeley colleagues for their support. And I'm happy to take questions if there's time. I don't know, Katie, is there time? Oh, you're muted, Katie. Absolutely. Let's see, are there any examples in the plant world of different plants forming a community based on complementary toxins? Oh, that's that's such a that's a great question. Well, um, so my colleague at the Rocky Mountain Biological Laboratory and UMass Amherst has studied um, this plant that used to be called Indian paintbrush, but those plants are in the genus Castilea. They're parasitic, so they're hemiparasitic. They they can photosynthesize. But if you dig down in the soil and you trace where their roots go, they probe inside the roots of other plants that are growing near them. And those Castilea plants steal sugar and nutrients from the other plant. Okay. And that is not good for the plant that is having its precious sugar and nutrients being stolen. But what's really interesting is that uh, there are these lupin plants. Everybody knows what a lupin is, right? It's in the Fabaceae. They make these particular alkaloids that are really good at, you know, preventing insects from eating them. And these Castilea plants are able to not just steal the sugar, they're able to take the alkaloids, bring them into their own tissues and use them to defend themselves like the monarch. So in that case, this is a parasitic relationship, right? So it's a type of symbiosis, but only one benefits and it's at the expense of the other. So it's very much like the monarch and the milkweed, but plants are doing this too. It's not just the animals that are stealing these chemicals, right? So, um, but maybe what your one of your listeners is asking is, is there some, you know, is there a situation where they're they're benefiting each other, right? Where Where a plant might be, sort of shielding another plant by being really toxic or something like that. Well, um, that certainly could be true. Um, I'm aware of situations, um, and I talk about this in the book, like the eucalyptus trees that are in the Berkeley Oakland Hills that are introduced, right? So they make um, a variety of chemicals, including chlorogenic acids, which is also in coffee. So it's not particular eucalyptus, but they make a lot of it. And it's in this thing called fog drip, which comes off the leaves of the eucalyptus, right? And it's dripping onto the forest floor. And it's thought that one reason why when you walk under those eucalyptus groves up there, they're just devoid of other plant life, right? There might be French broom, but there's nothing else up there. And it's not because it's a canopy, you know, that's, it's not that dense in terms of, of shadiness. So what is going on there? And it's thought that the eucalyptus, um, the fog drip from the eucalyptus is, is allelopathic, which means it has a toxic effect on the plants growing underneath it, the competitor plants that are growing underneath it. And a hint that that's actually the case is if you go to Australia where the eucalyptus are native, the, the plants that, under, that grow under those eucalyptus are resistant to the chlorogenic acids that are in the eucalyptus trees. So they've co-evolved with the toxic plants, have adapted to them, and have been able to sort of overcome that allelopathy, which I think is just fascinating. So, but in the introduced range where they've only been here, you know, what, a hundred years to 200 years, something max, there, there hasn't probably been enough time for that plant, native plant community to overcome it to the same degree. So um, that is a you know, a, uh, a vignette, and there are several like that in the book, but that's a great question that, that your listener had. Thank you. Um, I think, uh, Noah, are you able to stay after eight o'clock? Yep. So I want to thank everybody for coming.
and hope to see you again in February when we're going to have another lakeside chat on February 2nd. But thank you um, to Noah, to um, all of the people we have worked with in the past month. It's been wonderful collaboration of people caring about the lake and learning and really uh, very thankful that we have you. We want to thank the Elks Lodge number three um, in San Francisco uh, for generously uh, giving us funding this year with a grant to help us uh, with community building activities and education for young people that you can see in progress here. Um, coming up, um, Lakeside Chat number 39 on February 2nd uh, will be about nutrients in San Francisco Bay with um, James Urban, who is um, uh, a retired um, uh, director at one of the um, at the, one of the biggest um, water treatment plants in affecting San Francisco Bay or contributing San Francisco Bay, and has been um, so he'll be talking about nutrients in the bay, and we want to get a good discussion going on about what's going on with um, with that uh, issue of concern. Uh, we will be out on uh, next uh, week from tomorrow, January 13th, at the Sailboat House March to uh, do community service um, in honor of Martin Luther King Day of Service. So please um, consider coming out and joining us for that. That's um, a beautiful location. Lots of native plants uh, were planted uh, as part of the Measure DD um, beautification of Lake Merritt and also great birds. Okay, um, Lakeside Chats are, are recorded and you will receive a recording um, after light editing in a week or two. So uh, we'll be sending those out to everybody. And you can also find all of our uh, now 30 um, some uh, programs on our playlist. Um, the Lakeside Chats are rebroadcast by the city of Oakland's um, KTOP channel 10. And you can um, find it by going onto the um, City of Oakland website and um, searching for um, KTOP. Uh, they rebroadcast the um, um, current Lakeside Chat of the Month in the last two Sundays from 6 to 7 p.m. Um, they broadcast um, older, a selection of older Lakeside Chats in the first two Saturdays of the month. We're really grateful for them for making um, all of these wonderful uh, talks available to people in another way. Um, if you enjoy what we are doing um, at um, Lake Merritt and in bringing all of this um, people to come and uh, wonderful guests to come and talk to us about the lake and about um, issues, um, community and science, um, please consider making a donation um, we can use the uh, funds for um, supporting our on-site um, programs and also uh, continuing our lakeside chats. Uh, so if you go to our website, there's a donation button and it looks like that. Um, we have calendars for sale. Um, these are beautiful new calendars um, with new photos in them. Uh, we want to thank um, our producer, Rob Lamone, and um, our staff. Um, if you would like to come out and help us, we are looking for people interested in coming out and teaching and, and getting to know the lake uh, better to share that with other members of our community. Um, our mission is uh, we're a citizens group advocating for the Rotary Nature Center in Lakeside Park delivering interpretive nature and science programs. And we have many partners and um, we are uh, stewards of the wildlife refuge. And we regularly work with school groups and members of the local um, community. And this looks like a repeat. And so uh, we want to again, thank everybody and uh, we can return to a discussion with um, Dr. Whiteman. Yeah, there's one question um, in the chat. Someone just raised about this um, member of the Holly family in the United States called Yo. It was called by indigenous people Yopan, I think. 
and primarily from the southeast part of the country of the U.S. and the mainland U.S. And that was used by indigenous Native Americans um, as a tea and, you know, um, for other purposes, they used it and still do, I think. And um, that was used and is mentioned, um, this, this uh, listener of yours is pointing out um, that, you know, that definitely was used probably by Europeans um, or early on um, uh, as well. And I don't know about the, uh, the removing it as a competitor to the Chinese uh, tea. That's really interesting by English tea merchants. That, that could very well be true. Um, uh, that sounds like a very interesting story. But yeah, the Holly family in the Aquafoliaceae, many members produce caffeine. Yeah. And that's in Yerba Mate is a Holly from South America that is, um, that also makes caffeine. That the tree that has the leaves that are used to make Yerba Mate, which I have also enjoyed when I was in Argentina. Mm -hmm. Although it, I found it to be pretty bitter, but you know, coffee is too. And I talk about that in the book too. Like, why would we be drawn again to something we find so bitter? So that paradox became kind of fascinating to me. Um, and it's because we have a reward that is downstream of that. So we then learn to associate the bitter with something enjoyable. So then we start looking forward to the bitter, this thing that- Yes, Katie and Noah, this is David. Yeah, so any child would reject a, a anyone, right? A, a, if you first taste coffee, would reject it. It's not something that you would imbibe, right? But yet we do, and the same is true for tea, you know? So there's something about the bitter um, that is a signal that's learned to be associated with this positive thing, which is the reward that we get from the caffeine. Yeah. Well, Noah, Many of us, myself included, don't ingest coffee without sugar and cream. Yes. Well, I talk about, you know, David, I'm so glad you brought that up. I talk about that in the book. So these big studies that have been done asking why do why do who likes coffee that black? Who likes it with cream? Who likes it with sugar? Who likes it with sugar and cream? Do those people like dark chocolate? less do they like milk chocolate more you know all these things are related and there are genetic variants out there that are associated with the things that we're talking about so there are some preferences that we have can be at least some of the variation between people can be explained by having some of these variants or not you know a lot of it is learned behavior too that's part of it um, but, uh, there are people who are, um, more sensitive to these, these bitter chemicals in coffee, including caffeine. And there are people who are what we call slow metabolizers. So people who don't process caffeine as fast as others. So there's the receptor side, there's the detoxification side, then there's even the receptor side. So some people are more or less sensitive to the um, caffeine at the adenosine receptor level too. So these genetic polymorphisms that exist in humans contribute to differences in our preferences that are actually due to these receptor, bitter, detoxifier, fast or slow kind of things. Yeah. So you may be, if you, if you drink it with milk and sugar, you may be one of those people who is just more sensitive to it. Yeah. I see, yes, because genetic polymorphisms represent this sort of variation in terms of yes, how yes, they can respond. Yep. Um, I don't want to get us too far away, though, from the questions in the chat. There were a number of them. I wanted to try to help you and Katie out with them, but I'm not sure uh, exactly where we are in that queue. I want to ask about the first one that I see. Sure. It says, did you look at nicotine at all in your research? Yes, we did. And, um, you know, nicotine like caffeine is one of the most widely used alkaloids in the world. Unfortunately, nicotine in tobacco, when it's combusted in cured tobacco leaves. So the, the other thing I learned that it, when writing this book is that these nuanced details kind of matter. So it turns out that curing a tobacco leaf does something 
to the chemicals in the tobacco leaf that cause it when it's combusted to form these nitrous amines, which are carcinogenic. And that is why people who smoke cigarettes or chew tobacco that is cured, as opposed to people who chew tobacco that is not cured, and there are people who do in Europe especially, um, that these things matter in terms of how many nitrous amines are there in the material. So when it's ingested or smoked. And so tobacco really in the nicotine in tobacco ends up killing more people than any other drug on the planet every year. Um, from mostly from cancer and things like emphysema and uh, you know uh, pulmonary diseases. Um, but the nicotine itself in a pure form, is that a huge problem? It doesn't really look like it. It doesn't seem like that has terrible effects. Yes, it has some cardiovascular effects. Um, there are some studies that show that when mice are given caffeine or uh, nicotine vapor, that they will eventually get these adenocarcinomas, these adenocarcinomas in the lungs. But what we don't know, I think in humans, and this is especially true with vaping, and that's why I bring it up, where you have pure nicotine with some solvent in an electric cigarette that's heating it up. There are things like heavy metals, acrolin, other things in that vape smoke. It's very different from a combusted cured tobacco leaf. And I, I think we don't know enough yet about the downstream consequences of that. So I talked about the book too, which is really interesting, um, this nicotine question. But tobacco plants make that. It's a great insecticide. Things like the tobacco hornworm have evolved the ability to overcome it. They kind of, when they're eating the tobacco leaves, the nicotine goes into their blood. And it turns out that if they're attacked by spiders, they can release the vaporized nicotine through their spiracles, their breathing holes along the side of their body. And the spiders don't like that. So they call that defensive halitosis. <laughs> and I, I, I talk about, if you've ever kissed a smoker, you know what I'm talking about. <laughs> so that That's the first time I've ever heard halitosis used in a rather positive way. I know. I know. So, so can I just ask a question? I asked the, the original question. And, and the reason, one of the reasons why I did ask is that years and years and years ago, uh, we used to use nicotine as a pesticide spray. So it was used to kill uh, or at least deter insects on plants. And I was just curious if you encountered any of that we absolutely did anthony in the in the literature i talk about that in the book too that it was used as an insecticide and i also talk about a disease that tobacco um, harvesters would get from encountering the nicotine through their skin and that caused major problems for people harvesting tobacco and untold numbers of people suffered as a result of that practices changed so that people were protected from but what was happening is that it, there was dew on the leaves, you know, when they would go out in the fields in the morning and that water that was on the leaves as they were picking the tobacco would make the leaves wet, you know, and then they would get it on their skin and it would go, you know, they were getting enough of it where it would cause toxicity, all kinds of different symptoms. Um, and so, but it is like caffeine, a great insecticide. I feel like as an African American, I want to say I particularly resent that. Well, yeah, it's like terrible. It's terrible. And so if you go, if you Google that, um, the tobacco harvesting disease, you'll see it pops up, especially in places like North Carolina, South Carolina, you know, to tobacco heavy places. Um, yeah. So it was a huge problem. Thank you. And I can I also just mention one other thing. So I uh, searched for your book on uh, my local li library system. I'm in New York State and uh, it came up, but along with it came up a book called uh, Death by Shakespeare. And the book, it was about how William Shakespeare used to study everything that you talked about tonight about plants 
and and other other things and use those as causes of death in his writings so i thought well then he would have loved to have access to your book in order to uh you know I, I write see. write some of his uh I mean, it's, it's it's ironic you bring that up, Anthony, because the title of the book is from uh, Shakespeare's play *Antony and Cleopatra*. Ah, and that play, which is kind of an obscure play, there's a scene where she is lovesick for Antony because he's away at war, you know, waging war or something, and she's complaining to her handmaiden that she misses him so much, and what is she going to do, and where is he, and is he thinking about her? And she said, I basically, she says, I just can't handle this. Bring me the mandrake tonic. And um, then she said, so I can sleep away his absence. And, you know, the, the mandragora is what she called it, which is mandrake, which Shakespeare, you know, called mandragora, which is, um, which is mandrake, which is a member of the Solanaceae that has these tropane alkaloids in it that include things like hiscosine, which is used still as a medicine, and that is a soporific chemical. So that's one where you take it and you don't remember what happened. So that is a, this has this effect of escaping. And um, the quote in the play, she said to Charmian, her handmaiden, bring me my most delicious poison. <laughs> so Shakespeare knew that these things have two sides, the right, the medicine, the poison is the cure, right? There's these two-handedness two to all of these chemicals. And he played with that in all of his plays, uh, right? Yeah. There, there's, a, there's a plant um, that appears, a tincture of a plant, a tonic, uh, right? That, uh, and someone dies. <laughs> if, 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 thank you. If we may, there's another interesting question here, and forgive me if you, I missed you covering this, but uh, currently there are two lawsuits against Paneris suing them for deaths caused by their highly caffeinated lemonade. That yes, that's right. So there was, um, well, I saw a news story that they have this, I cannot remember what it's called. There, there was some name, uh, so there was an adjective about the lemonade that was the brand of Panera. I can't remember, supercharged lemonade, is that what it's called? Something like that. Mm, like that. And it was, you know, like sitting out, and you could just go get as much of it as you wanted, which is a problem because it's not bitter. There's so much sugar in it. You can't tell, right? You cannot tell that the caffeine is there. There's no way to meter the dose using our taste buds like there is when we're drinking coffee to some extent, right? So um, that resulted in uh, very sadly, it looks like, you know, they have to prove this, which I think is hard to do, but the autopsy would presumably be able to do that, right? Um, the medical examiner's report would probably be able to implicate it or not. And so that's what I would say about that. Yeah, but it's sad. It shows you that, these things we don't think of as toxic, you know, they absolutely can be at the wrong dose, at the wrong time, in the wrong place. Have you noticed uh, particular communities of plants forming around mutual or based on their complementary toxins? Yeah, we 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 um, addressed that a little earlier with the Indian paintbrush, the Castilea lupin thing, and then the eucalyptus thing. You know, I see. And what about the uh, study of fentanyl? Have you did you uh, address that as well? Uh, which one is that, David? Fentanyl. Fentanyl. Oh, fentanyl. Yeah, John T was. Um, yeah. So, so um, I do talk about fentanyl in the book. So that is a completely synthetic um, opioid. So it, even though it targets the same receptors in our brains and bodies, um, the opioid receptors that are normally targeted by our endorphins, right, which are natural painkillers, the peptides we make, mm -hmm. that um, if you get cut, you know, you feel pain, but then the pain goes away. And the pain goes away in part because of the um, endorphins that are binding to the opioid receptors, okay? But those opioid receptors, many of them are targeted by um, natural opiates like morphine and codeine and heroin, which is just a slightly adulterated morphine. But then fentanyl is a completely different drug class. It's an alkaloid, but it's completely synthetic. And um, 
was developed um, as a way to make a more efficient opioid. So it binds to those receptors, but it has different properties that allow it to get through the blood-brain barrier very easily, for example. Um, and it was so much more effective at targeting those opioid receptors, uh, became a favored uh, medication um, for pain as a painkiller. And the problem is um, for a certain percentage of the population, um, often people who have experienced abuse and neglect, in, especially in childhood, are susceptible to um, opioid use disorder. So if you look at it, I've taken, you know, Percocet to have my wisdom teeth removed, uh, which has, uh, you know, a synthetic um, opioid in it. Uh, I haven't taken fentanyl, but most people who take fentanyl don't get addicted to it, right? So why do people get addicted to fentanyl? And many, in many cases, they have, and I talk about this in the book, they have a history in their lives of neglect and abuse. And so this, um, this connection is not random, okay? Um, and so the, the sort of socioeconomic component of, of people who are most susceptible to things like fentanyl use disorder um, are people who are born into situations um, in which uh, they have neglectful upbringings, abuse and neglect and that sort of thing. And it's very sad, and but true. Would that stretch across to, for example, a particular situation where one third of the Chinese men were more susceptible to uh, opium addiction? Mm -hmm. Well, it's really uh, interesting. Or was that a more universal? No, oh, I think that's really interesting, David. So what was going on in China, according to the historians at the time, was that initially opium smoking was this fad that was very fashionable to do. So it was expensive and it was done in, you know, places where it was mixed with tobacco and it was this thing. It was just like a social status thing. But then there was a lot of social upheaval going on in China. This thing called the White Lotus Rebellion was happening. There was social breakdown. The economy was tanking. Um, so yes, there were all these correlates of things not going well. It was sort of like, um, you know, what was happening, you know, in the United States, uh, in a lot of communities, right? Um, where whether it was inner city or rural, there, right, that were impoverished places, places where there wasn't a lot of economic opportunity, things like that. Those are the places where these opioids have hit the hardest. And so I think it's all basically the same thing in my mind. But I'm not a sociologist, so I don't really know. But it's sort of just reading the literature. That's kind of what I get, David, from it. Yeah. That there's a Nadia has a question. Nadia Kamar. Yes. Uh, thank you, Noah, so much for the talk. It was fascinating. I have mostly a comment and just wanted to get your, your thoughts. It was interesting hearing hearing you and, and really realizing how the very thin line between toxins being a poison and toxins being a medicine. And I was just thinking about like Botox, you know, that's a, a toxin and it treats migraines. And, and that got me thinking about caffeine also being a treatment for migraines. And um, so just wanted to get your thoughts about how, you know, that sort of line between toxins being harmful and helpful to humans. Yeah, I mean, I think um, the Botox one is really interesting because so bacteria um, produce uh, this botulinum toxin um, and it is a protein. So it's a toxin that has a, a toxic effect. It's a it's not like an alkaloid. It's not like a simple molecule. It's an actual protein, like a bunch of amino acids, like strung together forms a protein. And um, Botox uh, is one, maybe if you were going to pick a toxin on a weight per weight basis that was more deadly than any other one, it would be Botox. Um, now Botox is used, there's maybe, I think a billion, over a billion doses or something last year used. 
mostly cosmetically, but as you point out, it's actually used in a, to treat a variety of ailments from this thing, this wandering eye condition where muscles, right, that are um, not functioning fully, you know, our Botox is used to correct that. It's used to correct, uh, to, to treat migraines. It's used to deal with pelvic floor issues. It's used to treat erectile dysfunction. It's used to treat a variety of ailments. And the way it works is by stopping muscles from working. <laughs> so it's, you know, that's why Botox, it's like, you know, it's allowing your face to, I've never used it, but it's allowing your face to relax, those muscles to relax. So wrinkles disappear temporarily, right? But the Botox, um, if you think about why, you know, you'll hear in the news like, oh, this lake in uh, Nevada that had 500,000 snow geese, you know, they died from botul botulinum toxin poisoning, right? So it's extremely, extremely toxic <laughs> if you ingest it, for example. But if it's injected into your body in a particular place, it's not, it's not going to hurt you at those doses. So to me, what was interesting is thinking about, you know, how toxins work. Another one that I talk about that is also... Um, uh, a really potent toxin is the pufferfish toxin, tetrodotoxin, which is um, also found in things like the blue ringed octopus, which is uh, venomous, brightly colored. It's also found in the skin of newts, including our newts that live here in Berkeley and Oakland, the Pacific newts and the rough skin newts, and in things like the eastern newts, the red Fs and the aquatic stage of the eastern newt, also called the red spotted newt. Those are brightly colored and in their skin are bacteria that, uh, you know, or in their bodies are bacteria that produce the tetrodotoxin. And there's this very sad story of this 20 something year old. This is from a, um, a medical journal, this report where he'd been, he was with friends, they were camping and he drank some whiskey. And then on a dare, they dared him to eat a newt, uh, I think a Pacific newt. He did and he died of tetrodotoxin poisoning yeah. about three or four hours later. So the, you know, and you hear in, especially in East Asia, um, where pufferfish is eaten, you know, parts of the pufferfish are eaten, but, you know, they call it a taste of death because, you know, if you eat the wrong part of it, you know, mm -hmm. people, die of that also of poisoning from tetrodotoxin from puffer fish. So that is, that is another example um, of, of uh, this fine line, you know? Yeah. Anthony, did you want to say something? Or is your hand still up from earlier? No, I want to uh, ask. Uh, Noah, did you look into... Uh, honey at all. Uh, I'm a beekeeper and I know there are certain honeys uh, from rhododendron and yes. mountain holly and yes, I exactly. Yep. I'm glad you brought that up, especially the um, it's interesting because the toxins in delphinium and rhododendron, um, they sort of target the voltage gated sodium channel in our nerves, but they're different toxins. The rhododendron ones and azalea ones are called grayanotoxins. And then the ones in delphinium and monkshood ha have similar, you know, aconite, that's a different alkaloid, but they target the voltage gated sodium channel. And um, it's called mad honey, you know? So when bees collect nectar from rhododendrons and azaleas, for example, um, bring it back to the hive and evaporate the water off of it and make honey. If people go and collect that honey and eat it, there's you get this neurological effect. And it's usually not enough to kill you, but it's enough to cause neurological symptoms. So some cultures have tapped into that. And uh, for example, the flag of Nepal has a rhododendron flower on it. And there are a number of indigenous people there who use this honey medicinally and in spiritual practice, et cetera, particularly honey that is associated with rhododendron flowers. And also in Turkey, a similar phenomenon um, occurs 
And um, there, there's in, in that region of the world, there's actually a longer history of it. It was probably the first chemical weapon used by people against other people. Um, and so there's a story, this ancient Roman army was invading that region, Pompey's army, and the local villagers put out honeycombs that had granitoxin in it and made the army sick, you know, and so it sort of slowed them down. That's the apocryphal legend in, in you know, like Pliny the Elder stuff or where, wherever it's from. Um, but I talk about that in the book. It's really interesting. But the honeybees themselves, so this, you, you have to wonder, like, are they resistant to it at some level? So it looks like those bees that are sort of evolving in areas where there's a lot of rhododendron flowers, they do seem to have more resistance to it than bees like in Northern Europe, for example. So this is something that I found to be really interesting. That it's not maybe that surprising, but yeah, that this resistance may be a part of the story too. Yeah, I had been on a talk recently uh, from some research that was done by one of the Southern universities with uh, Gelsinium. And apparently that can be a little more toxic to bees than say rhododendron yes. honey yeah. uh, in con if it's concentrated. And especially right. for bees that overwinter, in other words, they become semi-dormant. Right. And so right. they're ingesting it without really having an alternative to eat right. and that has can have a negative effect on them it's the, it's the dose that makes the poison right anthony and yep. that yeah so if they're in that hive sort of stuck in there you know they can't they're not feeding on nectar they're feeding on honey and it's yeah it's a different uh, concentration there was you know, one let me stack a couple with you here if i can Yep. Do you know, uh, can you talk about how the albino redwood might become an albino and uh, whether <laughs> that harms the other redwoods around it? Well, and the story... Exactly, are... Oh, go ahead, go ahead. Oh, no, 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 go ahead, David. Sorry. I'm going to say secondly, I was going to stack two questions. Do, uh, a significant amount of caffeine is found in the hot, do you know if the significant amount of caffeine is found in the holly species? You already answered. Okay, so good. The, yeah, the yopon, the that's the Native American word mm -hmm. for the that particular plant, that holly species that's in the southeast. Um, but the albino redwood thing, I mean, so the way redwoods, I mean, redwoods are amazing because you know this. I don't know if you read this New York Times story. But that state park by Santa Cruz, you know, that I always forget the name of it, that, that you know, had 2000 year old redwoods burn in the last fire. And it was looked so terrible. They were all charred. All the green was gone. Yet they most of them survived and they sprouted new uh, needles from, you know, 2000 year old buds that are in that bark that were dormant. Okay, so they have this regenerative ability that is extraordinary that evolved in a in the context of fire mediterranean climate that we have here and um so what happens is when a redwood's cut it doesn't mean the trees it doesn't mean that line is dead because from that stump will re-sprout you know new growth and that those sprouts could form a tree so that kind of clonal growth that is so typical for redwoods you know they also produce by pollen and seeds right um but uh the vegetative growth the clonal growth that comes out of these stumps um is is really extraordinary and i think the albino redwoods what happens is one of those will lose the ability to make chlorophyll and but it's still connected to the root system of these other redwoods that are you know, genetic clones, pretty much of it, right? There's somatic mutations, but roughly they're the same individual. But those can make chlorophyll, right? And they're, but they're tapping into the same root system. So the albino one is sort of, a, it's, it's a parasite among a set of clones of itself. And so, yes, it's reducing the fitness overall, maybe of that clump, but by how much? Well, it depends how big the tree gets. And is it bad? Well, you'd have to measure that. Is the seed set lower? Is it, you know what I mean? So it's probably pretty trivial when it's small, um, but I would imagine if, the, if that albino redwood gets really big, 
then it's probably taking a lot of nutrients and sugar from the other trees that it's near. So that's kind of interesting. They're rare. I mean, I think it's not great to not make chlorophyll if you're a plant, right? The only ones that don't make it are parasites, like, um, you know, Orobankaceae is a family where they're almost all parasitic. Um, and don't, and many of them do not make chlorophyll. Um, and so some of them, you know, uh, are completely reliant on getting nutrients from uh, the roots of other plants. That was great. I'm afraid we're at time now, I believe. And so- We have a couple really, uh, we have some questions here. Can we still do Damon, that? Great. I'm sorry. If uh, we can still do that, great. Excuse me? If we can still do the questions, a couple of more questions, great. Okay. Sure. Are you okay um, to go on? Uh, Damon had a question about conservation of the uh, oh. you know, synthesis pathway or for, for, one of the, for the isoprene, if I'm right. Or if you're here, Damon, you could probably really unmute yourself and ask the question properly. Oh, whether isoprene has evolved multiple times independently. Yeah, and it's like the, there are, yeah, the, sort of our isoprene production is through the cholesterol pathway and plants are doing something different. So yes, that, you know, the, the ability to kind of make these terpenoids has evolved multiple times independently. Yeah. Um, and then there was a question that was uh, a, a good one. From where do you imagine humans e.g. shamans, first learned how to use plants as medicine from apes. So I talk about this in the book. Um, one of the best, the, the coolest examples that I gave is this, um, this skull, the skeleton of a Neanderthal from Spain in this cave called El Cidron. Now, Neanderthals, um, they were a distinct lineage of human that branched off from the genus Homo um, in, a, in, the, in the sort of one of the initial waves of, of individuals in that genus, our genus, leaving Africa. They made their way into Europe eventually and Asia. This is before our species left Africa, okay? So Homo sapiens evolved sort of after Homo neanderthalensis left. Um, Africa, made its way to Europe and um, eventually died out there, but there was interbreeding between Homo neanderthalensis and Homo sapiens. So for example, I, people who are of European descent typically have two to 3% Neanderthal DNA in their genomes, okay? And um, which is interesting. And that is revealing this ancient hanky-panky between these two species or subspecies. It's not that surprising. They weren't that diverged, you know, so it makes sense that they were able to interbreed. But Neanderthals went extinct as a species. Um, okay, so they're gone. They left some traces of themselves in caves. Um, and they there's speculation that they had art, they probably had language, um, and were highly intelligent. Their brains are as big or bigger in some cases than modern humans. So there's every reason to believe they were like us, okay? And there's this one Neanderthal that had uh, an abscessed tooth in his skull, it's very clear. And they were able to sequence the genome of this Neanderthal and the Neanderthal's 50,000 years old and they got the entire DNA sequence of that Neanderthal, okay? This is just, it's, it's just incredible. Svante Pavel won the Nobel Prize for this uh, two years ago, by the way. Um, but the other, the thing that's, so that was interesting. So they figured out that they called him, or I called in the book, I called him Sid, because it's from LC Drone Cave. This one Neanderthal, there were other Neanderthals in that cave, roughly of the same age. They did not have abscessed teeth. Sid had an abscessed tooth. They scraped the calcified tartar. When you go to the dentist and they descale your teeth, this is not when you floss at night. That's not what I'm talking about. I'm talking about that hard, you know, calcified tartar that is on your teeth. That is what the dental hygienist scrapes off. Well, because it's so hard to get off, it preserved itself for 50,000 years. And so what these, um, these biologists and chemists did, they ran that, they scraped the calcified tartar off of Sid's abscess tooth. 
and all the other teeth in his mouth and all the other Neanderthals that were in that cave that didn't have abscess teeth. And what they found in all the Neanderthals were signs of what they ate, right? In that calcified tartar. So the chemical signatures of the stuff that they were eating shows up in the tartar. You know, and they were eating stuff that you would imagine people would eat, starchy things and whatever. But then Sid's teeth had a set of chemicals that were unique among the Neanderthals that they examined. And one of the chemicals that he had um, was this thing called chamazuline, which is from yarrow. And uh, yarrow is still used as a medicinal and was has been for millennia. And it's um, chamazuline is a prothin chemically or pharmacologically, which means that it has a similar um, mode of action as ibuprofen. It's an anti-inflammatory. Okay, so that's one thing. They also found traces of um, poplar bark and poplar bark has pretty high concentrations of salicylates like salicylic acid. Aspirin is acetylated salicylic acid. So it's another anti-inflammatory thing. And then this is kind of mind blowing. When they sequenced the DNA from the calcified tartar, they found penicillium um, DNA, which is what penicillin is derived from. So this, and none of the other Neanderthals had this. Okay, they also, because they sequenced the genome of not just Sid, but the microbial, you know, remains that were in his mouth and body, they figured out what pathogens he had, what, what, why he was sick, potentially. And so they also, because they had his genome, they figured out that he was a, he was a bitter taster. So some of us are better at tasting bitters than others, and there's a genetic basis to that, okay? And you probably know this, but um, Sid was a taster. So he had the genetic variants that allow us to really discern bitter from non-bitter. So the idea is Sid knew what he was doing. There's no question about it. He wasn't just eating poplar bark, right? He would have spit it out. He wasn't just like eating penicillium bowl. He would have spit it out. He wasn't, you know, chewing on a yarrow. That's it's uh, nutrition. That's he fascinating. Yeah, the implication is that he was maybe self-medicating. But and if we look to our closest living relatives, the great apes, they orangutans and chimpanzees in particular have been studied for this. They definitely self-medicate. So they are, um, in, and chimpanzees are using a plant called vernonia um, to self-medicate. Uh, these females have been uh, very carefully watched and studied for years. And when these intestinal worm burdens get high, they go to the Vernonia plant and they kind of chew on the sap of it. They don't eat it. They chew the sap and then they spit out the bitter pith. So they are taking the juice from this plant. And that is definitely associated with reduction in worm burdens. Orangutans are doing different things with the uh, plants in the Dracinia genus, um, which are called dragon's blood because of latex, the sap is red. But that, okay, the cool thing about both of these stories, the Vernonia in Africa, Central Africa, and the Dracinia in Borneo, is that the local people near these places where the chimps are doing the Vernonia thing are also using those same plants for medicinal purposes. And so the question becomes like, who was watching, you know, who's learning from whom here? Was it, you know, like, was it us watching them? Was it them watching us? And it's not clear, but it's it makes complete sense that our closest living relatives would be doing very similar things, and they are. So this self-medication thing, it's like the other point of the book is we're not, you know, we're special in some ways, but we're not in other ways. And other animals are self-medicating and have been for a long time before we were. And we are taking it to the next level. Yes, we are, especially with science now. We can figure out what is causing right, us to be able to be cured of certain diseases. We know the chemicals. But people have been doing this for millennia. Every human culture does this. Every single one. Tinkers. It's trial and error. It's tasting something. Is it bitter? What is it doing? And the psychoactive stuff, if you take it, you know you've taken it. I don't know if I've taken aspirin, really, right? But I know if I've had a glass of wine. So then you kind of like can meter it. You know what it's doing. Maybe it's having more than one effect. Maybe it's killing parasites and making you feel good or not good <laughs> or 
good for one person, not good for another. So like, right, and we're sort of genetically all different. There's all these polymorphisms segregating in populations. And it's just fascinating that this interplay is there. We're testing the waters all the time. And the line between food and medicine is very thin. There's so many nice vignettes here in the notes about people's knowledge about this. And that's that. what that illustrates to me is how much this is just part of the sense, what it means to be human, right? So much of our day hinges on what we drink, what we eat, who we're with in those moments, right? It revolves around this stuff. Um, cures for things, right? What do people spend their time talking about? What is ailing them? What hurts today? Oh, my knee and this and that, right? <laughs> and it's like, this is what it means to be human, I think, is our, our wanting to use these chemicals to escape our gravity, you know, whether it's psychological or physical. You know, there's a couple of other things I'll say now that I would probably want to explore with you in maybe a future conversation. Uh, one is that you mentioned science earlier, but so today we could at a point where we can take like <clears throat> almost any item, no matter what its actual taste is and flavor it, however we would like to flavor it. In other words, you know, we can make a pile of wood taste like chicken. <laughs> and uh, so I wonder um, what kind of things this brings up in terms of um, <clears throat> the toxins and everything that we've been able to identify. Another uh, thought that crossed my mind is what role does the FDA, the Federal Drug Administration, play in looking at and managing the understandings that you are revealing? to us as they unfold in terms of how they show up in our um, processing and management of food and substances and uh, what is what I'm trying to say here, natural indigenous lands and that sort of thing. And so those kind of things. So, yeah, I think your first point, you know, the lemonade story is a cautionary tale and just your vignette about how you like taking your coffee with, you know, sugar and, and milk or cream to mask the bitterness. And when we do that, we, we prevent our bodies from really being able to, you know, say, whoa, this is too much, right? For the ingestion part. So the masking of it, um, you know, if it's carefully done, you know, like you do it, you know, you know exactly how much milk and sugar to add to make it how you want it, right? And you know, you're not going to overdrink coffee and, you know, hurt yourself. But that person going up to the lemonade thing at Panera apparently didn't, didn't, right? And they had no way of gauging that. So I think that is a scary thing, right? That, that now we're, that the alchemy is so good that we can mask things. And we have to, I think, be very careful about that. That, that lines up with this flavored um, nicotine and THC products in vaping products too, right? And that is linked to menthol in tobacco also, right? Which, which, you know, was a deeply problematic racist practice. And that itself, the, the, the sort of menthol adding that into the tobacco, um, it's, it's more toxic than just the tobacco itself. So, and then becomes preferred by people because it has this cooling effect in addition to the high that you get from the nicotine. So the amalgamation yeah. of these things is, is um, you know- You mentioned racist. I just want to say that it didn't just target with that, something like that ethnic groups, but also uh, youth with the candy. Yes, and the yes, flavored. Yes. Yeah, so I think, you know, we have to think about this in terms of like, well, we're a society of, of laws and right, what are the regulations that are governing all this stuff? And I think for a lot of it, the vaping stuff, it's kind of new and there isn't as much regulation, I think, as there should be um, for, but that actually applies to a lot of natural products that are being used as health supplements. 
So um, some of these health supplements I talk about in the book, one from green tea, this catechin that sounds just like, oh, it's green tea. That's not going to kill you. They're, they're, it was so problematic using um, green tea catechins as a weight loss supplement that the NIH wrote a, a book called Liver Talks that was just about this. And you know there are people who have had to have liver transplants because they were taking too much of this green tea catechin that just seemed like it's just green tea powder. It's not going to hurt you. And it's like, yes, it can. If you take too much of it, you will need a new liver. And so if you Google, you'll see this guy who had, you know, it's not just one person. So it, it's become, you know, this, this idea that what's natural is good. This appeal to nature fallacy is another central theme of the book. And well, just thank you. But you talked about this as if, and you've characterized it as if poisons are being produced by plants for various reasons. And we humans have adopted and evolved to use those poisons for our specific purposes. Right. And as if the uh, issue is the amount of dosage, there's one other additional thing that occurs to me, and that is that no matter what the amount of dosage is that we use, each time we identify something, it appears that, and it seems to help us, it comes with side effects or numerous side effects. Yeah. And is that universal? Is yeah. uh, what are, we, are we trapped in that? Absolutely. And I think that's because, you know, many of these chemicals, they don't target just one thing, or if they do, that thing may manifest in different parts of our body at different times, maybe even stretched across years, right? So yes, the, they have these pleiotropic effects. And um, that is because, right, they're, they're, they weren't invented by us with this specific purpose, even things like fentanyl. Um, they may reduce your pain, but they'll also cause huge problems, your ability to di digest food, for example, right? So those opioid receptors that are in your intestines, they're also impacted. It's not just the ones that are in your brain, right? That are, so yes, I, I'm glad you brought that up, David. I, I think these um, multi-causal effects are these unintended consequences are something that I think is a real issue, yeah. And I always have. Can I, if there, if, can I ask if there's anybody on the line who has still has a uh, a question that is went unaddressed? Uh, please, if they could speak up before we prepare to end. Wonderful, so wonderful. Yeah. Well, if there's something Thank we missed so in the much. chat, we can look. But well, there is a whole other direction, and um, that really intrigued me in your book and that was the idea of um, the interaction between uh, plants and their uh, their herbivores and the creation of toxins and then uh, specialized um, specialization that occurs that opens up new opportunities so you say that new plant species that are um, that evolve we get new insect species right and um, yeah and that um, a, a coevolutionary dynamo. So yes, and I'm yeah. wondering about the speciation model there in terms of you know, it's yeah. like um, well, I mean, I'm so glad you brought that up as a closing point because all the things that we're talking about that didn't evolve for us. Well, why did they evolve? Okay, yes, in in terms of resistance, but then those aren't good enough. Insects overcome them. What do they do then? They evolve new a new set of toxins or augment those ones. So it's like this ratchet that continues. And it's a result of this pressure from these insects that specialize, right, on them, overcome them, plant evolves new ones that work again, insects overcome those. So this coevolutionary arms race model um, that resulted in the co-diversification of plants and insects is thought to explain why we have so many species of plants and insects, right? And so yeah, so like the toxins themselves are the hinge point, the fulcrum around which that dynamo kind of whirls. And so coevolution that's through the plant toxins, um, it's like this chemical channel of communication there, of antagonism, <laughs> mutualism that is, that is driving the whole thing over deep time, over the last 450 million years. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> oh, it's 2 a.m. 
Anthony in New York. <laughs> Thank uh, you so much. <laughs> glad that you were able to join us. That's funny. So um, again, I want to thank everybody. Are there questions out there um, that people would like to ask? This is a uh, last call. <laughs> and I want to just thank everybody for being here and, and engaging in this wonderful conversation. Yeah, these were some of the best questions I've had so far. So this is a very August group. <laughs> I will say that. <laughs> I really surprised. enjoyed this. I'm not surprised, but I have to it's say. Sure. It's certainly been a heck of a journey. For the first 20 minutes, I can understand the words you were saying. No. <laughs> <laughs> well, you know, I am a, it's it's hard to escape my own gravity as a professor, you know, um, but uh, <laughs> sometimes I get carried away. <laughs> I, can I ask so about, much. This was fascinating. Can I ask about fun, fungi? Oh, oh. Sure. yeah. So, um, I talk a little bit about psilocybin in the book. That's an interesting one because you think about why would a mushroom make something that causes people to see stuff that isn't there and to have ego, you know, disillusion? Are they really the mushrooms? Did they evolve? For our benefit and it doesn't seem like they did <laughs> so if you look at when those mushrooms evolved the ability to make that stuff it's tens of millions of years ago in many lineages and the gene cassettes have moved around different mushrooms so there's like 20 or 30 different mushroom lineages that can make psilocybin and it's not just psilocybin that they make they this gene cassette contains the genes that encode the enzymes that make psilocybin but they also encode enzymes that do stuff to the psilocybin once the mushroom is injured. So psilocybin mushrooms, if you, it's well known if you have one and you take like say a key and just score the side of it, it will start turning blue almost immediately. And that blueing reaction, it turns out, we now know that that is caused by the enzymes along with the psilocybin that the mushroom makes these lacase enzymes, they transform that psilocybin a little bit so that the psilocin molecules that result, they connect, they bind to each other and they form these chains, kind of like the isoprenes that make the rubber, right? It polymerizes in the air and sort of becomes a, a, a thick sap, but only after a little bit of time. Same is true with the psilocin molecules when they oligomerize. Those oligomerized psilocin molecules have a particular chemical signature that's much like a tannin. And when tannins are ingested in the body, they can cause problems in the gut, right? So they directly can harm cells because of a redox reaction that they have. And it's thought that, that the psilocybin that's oligomerized does the same thing. So in my mind, the fact that these mushrooms are making tri tryptamine alkaloids, I mean, they're making tryptamine all the time. It's an amino acid. So it's not that many more steps to make um, psilocybin, for example. And um, that looks like it's a great defense against um, insects that might be eating the uh, mushrooms. And the fact that it binds to our uh, subclass of serotonin receptors and causes us to have this amazing or not experience has nothing to do with why it's there or why it evolved. And it's just, it's just a, a spandrel. It's just a, a, con, a consequence, not a cause of that psilocybin. And that seems, we, we think that's true also because if you look at something like reed canary grass, which is an ornamental grass in the genus Phalaris, um, they make DMT, which is, um, and 5-MeO-DMT, which is very much like psilocybin in, in structure and, and what it does in our brains. And it looks like these grasses also make these compounds as anti-herbivore defenses. And one of the reasons we think that is that in sheep that graze on fields of Phalaris grass, particularly in Australia, um, they get toxicosis from feeding on the Phalaris grass. So um, they have tryptamine toxicosis as a result of feeding on these grasses that make lots of, of tryptamine alkaloids, not just psychedelic ones like DMT and 5-MeO-DMT, they also make one called Gramine, which is not psychedelic, but similar in structure. Um, 
So it's not just there. You look at other places, it's like caffeine. It's popped up in Rubiaceae and Malpigiaceae in the tropics make DMT. Toads in the Sonoran Desert make DMT. Um, in their uh, parotid glands, in the big glands behind their eyes. Well, guess what happens when a dog bites a toad? Stuff comes out of those glands, it's like milky, right? And many toads make cardiac glycosides like the monarch butterfly sequesters from the milkweeds in those glands. So if you think about it, why is 5-MeO-DMT in those glands? It's a defense against enemies. <laughs> it's not there <laughs> to cause us to have these mystical experiences doesn't mean. So, we, are there? You know, we haven't. Are there any? Yeah. Are there any plants that defend against fungi? Are there plants? Well, so. Um, I mean, uh, the fungi are moving into their territory or well, something. Yeah. Well, um, there are. Yes, there is warfare between fungi and plants. Um, there's also symbioses that are positive, like the very. Right. The, the oldest fossil plants we have are from uh, this area of, they're found in Scotland, this place called the Rhiney Chert, and it's sandstone. Yes. And they're vividly preserved early plants. And the very first, they're the first land plant fossils that we have. And this has been seen over and over in them in the root cross sections, or what the, they're not roots because they don't really have roots yet, they're rhizoids. They're the structures that allowed them to pull water up from the ground, okay? In those very first land plant fossils are, um, are buscular mycorrhizal fungi that you can see in the cross sections of the fossils. So, and all land plants with a few exceptions today have mycorrhizal fungi that are anastomosing with their root hyphae um, dramatically increasing the surface area of the root absorption um, abilities that allow them to take up water and ions from the environment. In return, the fungi get sugar from the plant, in some cases amino acids, but mostly sugar, which, because fungi are not um, autotrophic, right? They have to, right? They, they require getting nutrients from other organisms. And so the, there's an ancient chemical dance between plants and fungi that's there at 410 million years, um, which is the, or, you know, the Rhiney chert is very old. And then separate from that, things like ergot fungus, do you know about that? And ergotine alkaloids? Oh. Yeah, so those are ones that cause things like um, St. Anthony's fire, which was a disease caused by contaminated rye and wheat in the Middle Ages, especially. Oh, yeah. Yeah. And so these ergotine alkaloids, you know, they're toxic. But others in that same group are used to treat postpartum bleeding still. So it, it's still a gold standard drug to treat uh, postpartum bleeding after um, people have babies. And so, you know, that is a fungal alkaloid. And the fungi are infecting the plants and the plants, that's not good for the plant. <laughs> but um, they do things like make false flowers sometimes, these fungi. So they attract pollinators to come and move the fungal spores. It's a pseudo flower. So it looks like a flower, but it's not a flower. But it's making the plant make it be like a flower, making, making it even produce nectar. So the fungi and the plants are also at war in addition to them, you know, also helping each other in the case of the mycorrhizal situation. So th this stuff is is also um, happening at that level, yes, between the fungi and the plants. Not very just cool. Plants. Yeah. And without fungi, we wouldn't have plants. <laughs> that's like, mm. you know, that that's the other cool thing. You know, it's not just that mushrooms are cool because we can see them and eat some of them, but uh, don't don't go out there and eat them if you don't know what you're doing. Um, but uh, you know the, the the mutualistic symbioses between plants and fungi are really the main event for the uh, the diversification of terrestrial life. Well, I want to be. It would seem to me that most of the uh, toxins that we consume and use as humans were not produced for our purposes. They were produced for plants relating to other plants. I want to be. I got that part. Yeah. Good. Yeah, and fungi for, you know, and it's not, you know, some of these chemicals arose in the plants, probably not initially as defenses either. They might have been used as signaling molecules or something.
But then natural selection co-opted them. That's what it does. It builds on the substrate that's there. It uses what's there, not what's ideal. And then maybe concentrates them in the leaves and those plants left more babies because they didn't get eaten as much. You know, that's how it works. There's no foresight, right? There's no designer. This is all, this is all sort of playing out uh, in, in, in nature. Well, until we arrive. Yeah, until we arrive. <laughs> that's right. Well, yeah. yeah, that's right. Yes. And now, you know, we're making our own. So we're like this extended, you know, phenotype uh, out there, all these drugs that we're able to make and synthesize. So in a way, it's like we're kind of like plants, but we're doing it consciously, you know, and in ways that are, I just read a story last week, they were using artificial intelligence to make a new class of antibiotics, right? So, which is amazing. And that that is a choke point for medicine is antibiotic resistance, right? And um, so far, you know, up to now, we've mostly tapped into chemicals that bacteria are using to kill each other or that they're using to kill fungi or that fungi are using to kill bacteria, right? Because penicillium comes from mold. It is used to kill bacteria that are competing with those fungi, right? That's That's the adaptive value from the penicillin moles perspective was making penicillin as a defense, as a sort of a competitive, you know, an offense really. And up to now we've been, I think, held kind of captive by this using natural products only. Um, and, and so things like artificial intelligence are going to help design drugs and new classes of drugs, I think. Yeah. Which is good. Well, if you want and have time, I think Damon has written something. Did you already cover this when you talked about psilocybin? Um, yeah, it's. Uh, I think there's a question in there. It's pretty scientific, but I think there's a question in there. You see that? Yeah, it says, um, uh, we see psilocybin in insect parasitizing fungi, fly death fungus, mastospora that seems to change their behavior. Any chance psilocybin and related tryptamines have multiple evolutionary uses to the fungi that could be separated by different evolutionary histories of the pathways and dung in wood loving fungi? It seems the pathways have moved between genera, but I'm not sure about insect parasites. Um, yeah, so the, I've, I've seen the study showing that cathinones, which are used to make bath salts like those drugs, are also produced by these same fungi, cicada infecting fungi and things like that. Um, None of those studies in the in the insects have really localized the uh, tryptamines themselves as causing certain behaviors. That has not happened. Um, it doesn't mean that they're causing the behaviors. We don't, you know, they might be. We don't know that. There's no evidence that psilocybin or anything like it causes any kind of reward behavior. So it's very hard to imagine a fungus making psilocybin to bring insects in like citrus do use caffeine to bring bees in to take advantage of that you know reward pathway there's no evidence that psilocybin has any impact on our reward pathways except in the opposite direction which is why it's being used to treat drug use disorders right um and so i would say that uh from the perspective of the fungi yeah there there's it's it's been passed around many different fungi that are sort of um, the mushrooms that are coming out of things like rotten wood and, and, and the like. And so one, one idea was that those mushrooms have evolved to make psilocybin to keep insects that would like to eat them that are living in that wood away. So that is one hypothesis for why so many different fungi have taken up those genes. They've moved horizontally between these fungal lineages. But I think there's so much we don't know. I don't think people have really studied this beyond a couple of papers where there's been more or less speculation. We don't know. And then I talked to the chemists who discovered the bluing effect from the psilocybin itself. And they were skeptical that those fungi are actually making psilocybin that are in the cicadas um, that have been reported. So they're skeptical of that. Um, yeah. Let, let me share with the people who... Uh who are with us who don't have the book. You've come a long way from a, a little boy who grew up on the shores of Lake Wobegon. <laughs> well, David, that's interesting that you bring that up. Yeah, I think, I mean, so I, yeah, I'm from a tiny place in Northeastern Minnesota. Um, and my parents didn't go to college. Um, you know, I had difficulties um, because of, 
my family or of origin experience. Um, you know, my dad was an alcoholic, so we're half my relatives. And uh, somehow I <laughs> got through that. <laughs> I was very lucky, I think. Um, I also think that my obsession with nature helped me escape it, escape that gravity of my kind of family of origin story and support from them, you know, um, what they what they were able to give. But um, yeah, I think that, you know, maybe my family was uh, addicted to, many members of my family were addicted to things like alcohol while I <laughs> was addicted to knowledge and being in nature. So, uh, you know, I, I probably still have those obsessive tendencies, you can probably tell. But um, sometimes they can be, they can be tapped, right, in a way that is productive. And so that's the other lesson I learned, David, uh, from that. A little natural selection going on there. Yeah, exactly. You know, thank you for that, 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 that sharing. Yeah. Uh, but I do want to uh, ask about, um, in, as your obsession is taking you far and wide, I get the impression from the media that the majority of uh, indigenous folk who have received some type of land rights and titles, particularly in tropical rainforest areas, kind of somehow managed to connect and be on the same vibe with you know, modern Western scientists around the need to protect the biodiversity uh, and that they're challenged and it's an uphill battle. But is my media sense kind of true that they there's a tendency for them to fall on that side and for those lands to be fought for and held by people who fall on that side? Yeah, I mean, I think it's, it's if you think about the war of nature, as I call it, this, you know, 450 million year old battle between plants and things that are trying to kill them, um, that war rages at its hottest in the tropics, right? Which is the region between the Tropic of Cancer and the Tropic of Capricorn. That's where most species are of life on earth. And most of those species are plants or insects that are eating the plants. So the vast majority of species are those two groups, plants and the, and the insects that are eating them. And the chemicals, right, that have evolved in the plants as defenses are most diverse in the tropics too. And so most of our drugs come from the tropics that are natural products. Now, what's interesting, David, is that a lot of those drugs are in plants that were first used by indigenous people in medicine, diet, et cetera, that were then co-opted and studied in more detail where compounds were isolated. But the, the effects of those drugs were already known by and large by indigenous people who were using them for various purposes. And one of the best examples is um, tubo curarine, which is, you know, have you heard of curare, which is, um, a name for arrow poison, an indigenous name from Amazonia and the Caribbean, various peoples all over the place for millennia made arrow poison concoctions from different plants. Some were from the strychnine family of trees, others were from these uh, trees that end up making tubocurarine, which was the first um, muscle relaxant, general muscle relaxant used in general anesthesia and revolutionized modern surgery. So it was up to that point, very unstable to do surgery on someone. You could Well, let me be clear with, with that one, you could actually maybe put it on your arrow, shoot somebody yes. and not kill them, but yes. cause their muscles to relax. That is what the indigenous people were using them to hunt and in warfare, but mostly to hunt. And they called it the silent death because you know a, it was a, either a blow dart or an arrow and completely silent. So it hits, say, a monkey in a tree that you're trying, or a bird, hits that animal, and then maybe three or four minutes later, it drops down to the ground. It's still alive, but totally paralyzed. So the curare is targeting the acetylcholine uh, receptors, the nicotinic acetylcholine receptors. And so then they would have this monkey or bird in there. It's food, right? So, um, so European and US and Canadian researchers sort of knew about this and took that curare and it was called, the reason it was called tubo curare or curarine, which was the alkaloid in it, was it was stored in bamboo. So by the indigenous people. And um, so it was shipped up to 
Europe first to Britain and then eventually to the US and Canada and analyzed and stuff. And eventually it was patented by various companies and none of that money, of course, ever flowed back to the indigenous people who discovered this, but it totally revolutionized modern surgery and resulted in the invention of the respirator, the ventilator rather. So, right, and the, the stories are nuts. I talk about this in the book. They're in Britain and the US, one in Salt Lake, one in London. These physicians, pairs of them, curarized themselves to, in order to describe what it did to them. So they took it themselves, injected themselves with it, and they had to be put on artificial breathing because they couldn't breathe anymore. And so they did this to experience it. Then they wrote down their experiences, published it in a journal, and the only thing I can think of it as, it's, it sounds like being waterboarded, like suffocating, right? Because they can't breathe. They're awake though, does nothing to your brain. So they're completely conscious, which is where the ether comes in. Because if you etherize someone, then they lose consciousness. So all of a sudden you can etherize someone and you give them an injection of the curare. And then you have a totally stabilized patient that can undergo surgery without it causing problems, right? Because they're not rigid reacting muscles to say a scalpel. And so that set our, our sort of modern medicine on this course to where we just take it for granted. If we're going to go in for surgery, it's not that big of a deal, right? It's like, yeah, it's a big deal. It's anesthesia, but it's all kind of worked out. Well, it wasn't <laughs> for a long time. And it was the curare from the Amazonian indigenous people that resulted in us being on that path. So that's a long answer to your question. That's just one example, but there's many like it. And I think um, if we're going to do one thing with our money, our powers, it's to protect indigenous people's rights and their land for their own sake. And there's lots of reasons for that, right? Um, but, you know, that is, uh, if we do that, we save the world, right? We save them and we save the world in doing so. Most of the carbon sequestration, half of it is on the indigenous lands. They're the most endangered people, languages, customs, um, and most diverse and most endangered, you know. Um, it's where most of the future drugs will be. It's where most of the food, uh, future food, you know, will be. Um, we rely on so few species of, for, our, for our food. That's a huge issue. So, so many things can be traced back to justice for indigenous people, I think. Well, you know, I really want to thank you for your talk and then, uh, and for your book and encourage others uh, to, to take a look at, at your book and uh, really acknowledge what you were just saying about the opportunities for sharing knowledge and communication and developing ways for all of us to see this world and show up. And so really appreciate your research and your work uh, and your book along those lines as a part of that process. Coincidentally, as a young man, I, uh, I worked for a company called Merck, which I believe at the time would have wow. been one of the um, wow. three, top three largest pharmaceutical companies in, in the world. And uh, I was in uh, the tropical rainforest of Brazil. Uh, my role, totally non-scientific and environmental, was to speak English with their executives and, and, and employees. Hmm. And they were able to pay me quite a bit to do that as I sought to explore the world and travel around. However, I think, and this is all just coming out in this moment, but uh, I was there in that area I didn't go there to work for Merck. I, I needed money. So I got a job because I spoke English mm -hmm. and that found me working and exposed to them and their processes uh, of identifying and developing uh, and sub researching uh, drugs and biological medicines and whatnot. Mm -hmm. But uh, it was actually Greenpeace that had taken me there. And so I was surrounded by individuals I guess, who were scientists and environmentalists and who had a keen sense uh, 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 about, and that was so many years ago, but about the things that you just said and how they were uh, at play. 
yeah. and uh, afoot and uh, that we needed to address them. So I wanted to just kind of share a bit about my background for our future conversations. Super and helpful to know that, David, and really interesting. Um, I'm sure, yeah, that just uh, your being there, you know, in the richest, most diverse rainforest in the world, that does something to you at some level. Without a clue, but okay. <laughs> <laughs> well, through osmosis, you know, in hindsight, it's like all things, you know. Yeah. Thanks for sharing that. Thank you. Yeah, and thanks to your 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 audience uh, for being here and so interactive. And I think we've got the most brilliant audience in the world. I am absolutely sure of that. <laughs> it's definitely, it's definitely I can't believe these people. the experiences <laughs> I've had so far. So, yeah. yeah. Yes, thank you so much. It was a wonderful, wonderful evening and wonderful talk. And thank you for sharing all of your knowledge and, and stories. And it's really wonderful. I think. We are at the end of the evening and want to thank you so much for staying with us for so long. We're going to make a recording to share with people and we'll share with you first, of course. And um, really, uh, I'm sure all of us are really looking forward to that. And thank you so much. No, you set the record for the longest lakeside chat ever. That's true. Is that right? Oh, wow. <laughs> well, that's good or bad, David. <laughs> um, no, that's great because it's been fascinating. Good. And you can go to www.mostdeliciouspoison.com and you can learn more about the book there if you're curious. I will send that out in the post chat. Yeah, for sure. All of and and many some of the things that were in the chat as well. Great. And there's notes, there's about 250 pages of notes there in case you want the references for different parts of each chapter. Yeah. Yeah. No, it's wonderful. It's great. Okay, everyone. I think we have um, come to the end of our evening. I want to thank you all. Thank you, Noah, so much. Okay. And hopefully we'll, we're looking forward to seeing you next um, next month. We're going to be talking to Jim Irvin about uh, nutrients in San Francisco Bay. Okay. Yep. Here's the beautiful cover. It's thank you so much. Thank you. See yeah. <laughs> Thanks, Noah. <laughs> Thank you. Thanks, David. Thanks, Katie. Thanks, Betsy. Thanks, everyone, for coming. And I hope to see you uh, all again at the next Lakeside Chat or at future Lakeside Chats. Thanks so much. <laughs>